So what do we talk today about? What did we talk yesterday about, right? Yesterday was amazing, I think. Uh, really challenging, really new topics. Well, r r like at least for me. Uh, and, and we cover, huh, see, I had to prepare this and I forgot. What did we cover yesterday? Here, this stuff, right? Only we talk about the GTN, a framework for automatic differentiation with weighted finite state automata, right? And there is also a website, right, of this stuff. Here. There is also an article, right? So you want to check this out. Uh, we should have mentioned in the in the thing, right? So again, this stuff here. Um, let me see. There should have been. Facebook, this one. All right, here there is like a summary of what this stuff is about, the, the thing we covered yesterday, right? And what it tells you here, and then if you even check the, the documentation, and <clears throat> in the examples, they even go through the, um, where is it? They, if you go through the example, you're going to be also see how to do uh, handwritten recognition, right? Anyway, so here we saw how we can use graphs, <clears throat> how we can augment PyTorch by using graphs uh, instead of tensors, okay? So this is like an ex extension. And then we we figure how to run back propagation through these uh, operations of uh, join, or uh, not, not, not join, the other one, intersection, right? So we have the uh, soft arg uh, softmax, right? We, we compute the forward algorithm, which is computing the softmax, and then we run back propagation. So if you compute the, um, the gradient of the softmax, you're gonna get the soft argmax, right? And then the soft argmax is gonna give you the gradient for each of these uh, items in the, which we had in the softmax, right? In the actual softmax. And then each of these cores were the sum of all the weights on the edges, right? And so the gradient goes for each edge, but then the same edge can be used in multiple paths. And so the gradients will be different. And where are those weights coming from? The network, right? So the network gives out the energy. That was one type of graph, okay? So this is how to move from, you know, using tensors to moving graphs in uh, deep learning. Today, Instead, we're going to be covering another type of graphs, similar but different, right? St still graph, but completely different manner, right? Today, we're going to be talking about how to have representation, how to have tensors living on vertices and edges of a graph, okay? Still graphs, different thing. I hope I'm not going to be confusing you too much. So if you want to read more, uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff, uh, Xavier Bresson, which made a, a few nice, very uh, lessons. So you can look up this tweet, right? You can just type from, you know, we already know this, right? We just do from X Bresson, and then you want to type uh, graph neural networks 2020 right you type this one you're gonna find this this thing right we already know how to use twitter right and so this is very good and of course one of these uh links is gonna be the uh the videos on, on my channel right so welcome everyone there you go okay so this is very good he's very like he's good uh moreover you also want to pay attention to where is it here, uh, Jure Leskovets and his CS224W machine learning with graphs, right? From Stanford, they have videos everywhere. Oh, you can find videos. I don't know if they're officially released, but anyway, you can find things, okay? Cool, so what are we talking about today, right? Graph convolutional networks, exploiting domain sparsity. Hmm. Okay, what's going on? We, we see this soon. So remember from last class, we talk about self-attention. We had this combination 
of elements in the set, right? So we had a hidden representation H here. It's going to be the combination of these elements X, which are given to you in uh, this set of inputs. So we have no order, right? We have no idea which is number one, which is number two. You can assign numbers, but to, to you know, to bookkeeping, but you don't have a sequence, right? You don't have an order, inherent order. So then you sum these columns, these, these vectors, by uh, you know first scaling them by using a coefficient alpha. Where are these alphas? They are contained this vector a. Right? How many items has what is the size of a? T. Why the size of a is t? Because there are t axes in my set. What is the final dimension of the sum? Well, it is the same size of each of these pink things. Each thing has size n. Therefore, the size of H, which is the summation of all these columns, scaled by you know alpha, are gonna be still in Rn, of course, right? So you're summing oranges, you still get oranges, right? Even if you use coefficients in the front. All right. Where 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 was this alpha A coming from? Do you remember? Type in the chat. Where was A coming from? What was A called? A was my attention vector. Where was A coming from? Do you remember? Yes, no. You have to type in the chat, otherwise we don't go anywhere from the input. No, of course not. The attention. W w where is A coming from? X is my input, right? X is the, we have a set of little X's, X1, X2, XT. And then we said we sum these components by using coefficients alpha. Where are these alpha coming from? How did I compute these alphas? Where is this vector A coming from? Do we, do we remember? There are 50 people in class. Can someone help me out, please? No, yes, we don't know. The queries, yes. So we had some queries, which was a question. What did we do with the question? You have a question, how to make pizza? What do you do then? No, how to make pizza margarita? Then you compute, you check the uh, alignment, the similarity with all the keys, no? Pizza margarita, pizza marinara, pizza quattro formaggi, pizza alla diavola. And then whenever you find these matches, what do you do? So we have a bunch of uh, scalar products. What do you do afterwards? Is it A, the output of the scalar product? No. What is A? Do we remember? Yes, no? Soft target max, yes, yes. Yeah, so given the scores, right? Given the scores, you want to have a conversion of that into something that sums up to one. Or you can use an arg max, you just pick the highest score and then you retrieve one recipe, right? You pick up the pizza margarita, pizza whatever you want to get to cook. Or if you want to make a mixture of recipes, don't do that for Italian cuisine. It hurts my heart. But anyway, if you have two matches, right? You're gonna pick half of that one, half of the other, right? How do you do half and half? Well, you just pick the soft arg max of this course. Okay, very good, Raul. And, and, and Alan, okay, cool. So A was computed, right? It was computed by this similarity, scalar product alignment, whatever you want to call it. All right, moreover, uh, we also saw this slide in the convolutional neural net uh, lab lecture, right? So in particular, the one I want you to remember, pay attention, was that my X, no, my set of data points of, you know, my, 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 my data, my observations is going to be these X I's, no, I is going to be my index that allows me to, to address different of the uh, different items in this set. 
these are functions, right? Going from this domain omega, so from omega to this RC, the channels, right? And we saw many other examples, right? We saw things that are moving in one line, things going on a plane, uh, even more exoteric things. But anyway, we go from one domain to a, you know, vector space, right? R RC. So we map one item here, lowercase bold omega, into, you know, a function that is changing when you move the point, right? So you have a vector associated. So we have given a point here, you have a vector, right? In RC, as you move, this vector changes. You see this, right? You move here, this vector goes like this. You move here. So you have a vector associated to each location of this domain um, omega. Cool. So these are the foundations we are going to be building on top, right? So given that this is understood, given that the other part is understood, at least two people uh, are following. I don't know what happened to the rest of the class today. Uh, so let's see how we can move, on, move forward in today's class. So GCN, what is GCN? Graph Convolutional Network. We have a vector A which before we were calling this the attention vector, which was coming from the soft argmax of these um, metrics of, uh, of transpose keys, right? And my query, my, my Q, right? sorry, I'm, I'm flipped, right? So you have the metrics of transpose keys and then one query, right? So you have uh, row, column, row, column, row, column, and then you have these vectors of scalar products. You send it through the, soft argmax to get this pseudo probability. And that was my A, right? Here, my A, I'm gonna call it agency vector. And it's given to you. Finish, the lesson is concluded, more or less. That, that's the only difference, okay? It's, that's the only difference from Yes, yesterday, well, last week lesson, okay? Last week lesson, we learned that A was the attention vector, which is computed through, again, the transpose K vector matrix query. You have the scalar products sent through the soft argmax pseudo probabilities, or so argmax, you get the one hot. Here, A is gonna be a binary vector, which is given to you by whom? Oh, we don't know, by someone, okay? The, the data structure, so the data you observe has a specific structure underneath. Hmm. All right, enough, you know, uh, spending words on one line. Let's see what else is gonna appear on this screen. Oh, okay, picture, cool. So we introduce now my V, what is V? V is my vertex, my, my, my given vertex, right? On which I have the representation X, and the hidden representation H. What is V? V is the same as Omega before. Remember, we have a, a Omega, capital Omega domain. Each item here was a uh, lowercase Omega. Now I have this lowercase Omega is going to be exactly this vertex V, okay? So this could be my space of vertices, for example. Okay, what else? Oh, well, of course, so given we had done this for the last lesson, right? We had the generic X and then we had also the other axis, right? Same here. We have the given V, the given vertex and all the other vertices VJ. So the other vertices VJs have representation XJ and hidden represent, representation HJ, right? Another one, another, another one, one more. Okay, cool. So, so far, nothing has changed. As we have seen last time, we had these items. You cannot sort them because they are in two dimensions. I don't know how to, how to sort things in two dimensions here on the screen. And so these are elements of a set, the set of vertices, right? Which you can number, but you can shuffle the number. It doesn't change anything. Huh? Oh, first difference. Now, someone gave you some connections. This arrow shows you that VJ has, is a source vertex. There is an edge that goes to the V vertex. Okay. Same for the other one. 
Then, for example, V is connected to the other one on the left hand side, and then we have three more connections. Cool. So now, what is this A vector? My A vector will have its own components set to one if and only if the jth item has an uh, arrow towards my own self, right? So I am the vector V, right? My, my vector V will have a agency, uh, so my, my vertex, my vertex V will have an agency vector A, and the jth component of my agency vector will be set to one if there is an incoming connection from that vertex, okay? So let's say uh, how many, okay, what is the size of the vector A right now? Type in the chat. More than two people, and not just Raul and Alan, please. What is the size of the vector A? How many items, elements, does the vector A have? Uh, it was T, yes. What is T in this case? I, I drew things on the screen, right? Lowercase T it was, but yeah. What is T in this case? In this specific case, I, I drew things on the screen. What is T? Yeah, I, I see Camila. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how many, how many Vs do we have? So Camila said number of Vs. How many Vs do we have? How many nodes do we have now? Can we count? Six. Fantastic. Okay. So A will have size six. Fantastic. Let's call this one. Uh, let's count from, from left to right, top to down, right? One, two, three. Four, five, six, let's say, right? So what is gonna be the agency vector for my V? Can, can you okay, tell me, maybe Camila? It's gonna be a vector of all zeros, and then which components are gonna be set to one? If this is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is node three, right? One, two, three. So if this is node number three, right? The vector will have first component and second component set to one because these two items will have a edge coming towards me, okay? So this means alpha j is gonna be a zero vector and has, well, I didn't say that, but okay. It will have the components associated to the incoming connection, right? Set to one, okay? So if this is element one, and this is like, if this is called vertex one, vertex two, these two have an in, like an arrow towards myself. And so I will have a one in correspondence to the first element, a one corresponding to the second element. Cool. All others are zero, right? Self-connection. There is no self-connection, zero, 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 okay? So one, one, zero, 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 right? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. Cool. So what is lowercase d? Well, lowercase d is the number of incoming edges, right? So that's the one norm of A, right? Just sum the ones. Okay, so what is my hidden representation? So what was the hidden representation before? It was simply the sum uh, items in the set, right? Scale by the coefficient. Guess what is going to be here? The same. Ta da. Okay, what is capital XA? As we have seen just five minutes ago, capital XA is the summation of the columns of the X, right? By the coefficient stored in the A. So in this case, what is going to be H? Just the sum of the X living on vertex one and the X living on vertex two, right? Because I have only those two set to ones, right? If you have a A that is one hot, you simply select in the J, uh, whatever item, right? The SU of the X on the first in alpha. I don't know if there's sum. Yeah, that's the sum of the X uh, on where there is the ones. Yes, of course, right? Because this means, as we have seen before, right? So we already seen this just before. 
Whenever you have a matrix times a vector, matrix times a vector means you sum the columns of that matrix, right? X1, X2, blah, 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 Xt, scaled by the coefficient in the vector, no? So if A has alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha t, then you're gonna have the first vector uh, scaled by alpha 1, second vector scaled by alpha 2, and so on. Okay, let's go back here. All right, so here is gonna give the sum. So what's the problem with the sum? Well, now if you have multiple more, more incoming uh, edges, your hidden representation is gonna be blowing up, right? So now the hidden representation is gonna be proportional to the number of connections. How do we fix that? Help me out. Okay, awesome. We divide by D, there you go. Then guess what? This is going to be giving me uh, just some uh, combination of these vectors. Why not adding some rotation? No, why not? Because convolutional networks, right? So let me put a rotation matrix uh, V. Cool. Uh, did we have forget that we have we forgotten something? Maybe there is a space on the left hand side. I guess yes. So. Perhaps we also may want to look at what is my own relation, uh, no relationship. <laughs> Why am I talking about my relationship? My own representation, right? What is my, my own representation? Maybe we want also to rotate and add my own representation, okay? There you go. Then, if we remember, what are neural networks? Rotations and answer. Rotation and Squashing, there you go, okay, awesome. Very good, so what is F? We know, positive part sigmoid hyperbolic tangent. So given that we have now a set of axes, right? So we have this X, I goes from one to T. Guess what? You're gonna have a set of, so if you have a hidden representation per item, if you have, a, you have exactly, why, wait, why the self-representation? Why not? You can put as u equals zero, then there is nothing there, right? Nevertheless, if you may want to use yourself as value, then you can actually learn u to be different from zero, right? So uh, the, the answer to why the self-representation uh, self for um, expressibility, right? You can add one more degree of freedom. We were saying, if we have a sequence, uh, sorry, it's not a sequence, it's a set, right? If we have a set of axes, a set of vertices, and for each vertex, we compute a hidden representation, of course, we're gonna have a set of hidden representations. In matrix notation, I just put all capital letters and I just press, you know, cap locks and I type the same equation. Nothing changed, right? I just put capital letters. What is happening here? Instead of having one vector A, you have, more, many columns, right? Pam, 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 pam. Here, instead of having one X, you have the whole pam, 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 all axes. Cool. Uh, and it works out, right? Because how many A's you have? One, as many A's as element in X. So if you have one A and one X, here you have all axes, and then you have all the A's, right? What is D minus one? Well, that's just the, these, the, the diagonal of D I's, and then you take them inverse. Cool, that's it, finish. This is the graph convolutional network. Uh, it's like convolutional neural nets, but then you cannot actually, you don't have the order of things, right? So in normal convolutional nets, whenever you have like a temporal signal, you, you can have a kernel, which is, you know, if this is your given sample, your at, you can look at a few samples on this side, a few samples of that side, and then you have this kernel moving, right? Boo, boo, boo. Uh, if you have an image, right? You have an image like that. You have like this this kernel around here. If this is your central kernel pixel, right? Why do I have central? Because it's always odd number, right? These kernels. Then you can have some. You know, you can watch up. You can watch right. You can watch down. You can watch left. And then you move this boo, boo, boo around, right? But then there is order, right? There is top. There is bottom. There is left, and there is right, right? Now, what happened with graph? Graph, you have no idea where up and down or left and right are, okay? Because each vertex can have as many incoming connections, right? And so you're, you're doomed, right? You can no longer distinguish. 
this is different from the other one. Unless, ah, okay, actually I can even do this now. So right now everything looks the same, right? We have completely lost sense of orient orientation. I'm like, yee, I have no idea anymore where I'm going, right? So everything looks the same. So how can we distinguish things now? Can someone help me out? We have vertices and every vertex looks the same, right? Well, they have representation on it, but I cannot tell one vertex from the other, right? How can I start telling them apart? So how am I connected to these vertices? Through a edge, right? If only these edges would have, you know, let's say some colors on them, right? So, so that I can tell different things apart, right? So let's do that. Let's put colors on these edges, right? Let's also introduce now a representation living on the edge to spice things up, right? Such that we can learn to put some order in this graph, okay? All right. I hope it's understandable, right? And despite, despite that I'm, you know, crazy, but I think I, I'm, I'm trying to convince you that things are done in a specific way because there is some logic behind, okay? Are you with me? Yes? No? Give me a thumb up, please. <laughs> it's so hard to teach here without the reactions. Okay, very good. At least one person is appreciating and supporting. <laughs> All right. We are talking now about residual gated graph convolutional network. This comes from Bresson and Laurent, uh, 2018. And this is the same dude who made a video I showed you before on the uh, last year class edition. So again, we had the vertices, the V, myself, right? With representation X and H, you have the other VJs. Uh, in, in green, which have the X, J, H, J, you have all these other vertices. And then the difference now, as I told you, I'm going to have colored edges, right? So the actual color, I'm going to just have a representation. So the E, J represents the edge, the J edge, right? And I'm going to have these connections here, right? And so on this edge, I'm going to have a input representation EX and a hidden representation EH. Okay. So these are my colors, right? Like, like a manner, a way to distinguish between vertices, right? So vertices, they are all made equal. They have some representation on them. But then if I want to treat them differently, then I now have the option to change not just the weight on the edge, but actually a representation, like a full vector on this edge, right? Okay. All right, so how do we do this stuff? So if you remember from before, we said, oh, okay, so let, let, let's start from the title, right? So the title is residual gated, residual, right? So let's first work. What, what does the residual mean? What does residual mean? You're gonna have a residual connection which means you have yourself plus something. Okay, there you go. So I started with this myself plus something. Uh, as you can tell, just from the beginning, you can find spot errors in this paper, I think. If you have something plus something that is always positive, the stuff will drift, okay? So I argue here that we may want to have as well an additional parameter in front of this positive thing, okay? So I assume, I, I argue here that a missing parameter is in front of this item. Anyway, what's inside? Well, inside we're gonna have what? We start from the left-hand side with my self-representation. So I'm gonna have a matrix A multiplying myself. And then I'm gonna have a matrix B multiplying someone else, right? Okay, cool. Uh, then what we said before, uh, so this B is like the same as V in the uh, line below, right? In the page before, right? So here we said the V was multiplying these other axes, right? So here we have this A, no? This agency matrix. We haven't yet here at this one, right? So this is just the rotation of these axes. 
Cool. So first of all, you notice here I have an XJ, right? I don't have this matrix full thing. Uh, moreover, now I want to sum this rotated XJ, this rotated incoming, uh, basically, representation. I want to modulate it, right? I want to change the amplitude using the second word in the title, a gate. Right? There we go. So we have a eta, which is my gate function on the representation living on the edge. Okay. And this should be, this is my EJ, bold EJ, which is similar to this stuff. We're going to define it soon. Uh, what next? Well, as we saw before, we have to, we were summing all these incoming, uh, like the one corresponding to the ones, right? So all the vertices that are connected to myself. So here I do the same. I sum all the representation for the vertices that are connected to myself. Okay. Uh, so what we need to define, what is this E, right? So we, I haven't defined this EJ. Oh, there's a question. A and B can be said to be the weight matrices on the edges. No, there are no, no. Or are they something else? No, 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 no. There is no, uh, A is the weight matrix that is on myself, right? So this is not on the edge. Um, oh, I see what you mean. Like this would be the matrix on my self connection and this would be the matrix on the, uh, on the incoming edge, right? Yeah, I guess you can, you, you can see this this way. Sure. Yeah. 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 Right. So a can be thought as being the weight matrix that is living on my self connection and B can be thought as the weight matrix living on the incoming well on the on the edge that connects someone else to myself right and so whenever you go yeah whenever you go through that you're gonna get this multiplication but then again here we want to be able to mod modulate as well this incoming rotated representation by this gate and this gate is function of this e edge something we figure what is this so this edge it's simply this summation of multiple terms, C, D, E, uh, which is the you know, edge representation. So the input representation living on the edge, this one over here, uh, then is summing the myself, uh, so the, 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 sorry, my bad, the external vertex representation, this guy over here, and then is summing a rotated version of my own representation, right? So we have a rotation, of the represent input representation living on the edge plus a rotation of the representation living on that vertex, right? On the jth vertex, plus the rotated version of my own representation. Okay. So all these are X, 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 right? So this is all the input, right? So all the input, edge representation, foreign vertex, myself. So what is this uh, eta? Well, eta is going to be some sort of uh, soft argmax, right? We have this, instead of having the exponential here, they use like sigmoid of the representation divided by the sum of the sigmoids, right? Again, like a soft argmax with different, uh, whatever, uh, nonlinearity, okay? How about, if we want to have multiple layers, right? How do we create multiple layers now? So let's say this is my H, my first hidden layer, okay? How would you go about to generate the second hidden layer for the vertex representation and for the edge representation? Just repeat, right? So you, 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 you keep the same graph, but you keep these, you know, uh, equations, right? And so we're going to have now that my hidden representation uh, on the edge is going to be, oh, I forgot this one, like the residual connection, like the previous representation plus this positive part. Again, here, I believe there is a missing weight. This stuff otherwise just drifts. Anyway, we were saying we can replace a x with the Elf uh, hidden representation. This is going to be simply the representation at the L layer 
uh, for the jth vertex, right? And this one simply is going to be the hidden representation of the layer L plus one, right? So if you replace X with H at the layer L, and then the XJ with this hidden representation, right? At the layer L, then you're gonna get the hidden representation of the next layer. And you can do the same for all of, you know, around here. Cool. So that was the um, slides. Are there questions? If there are no questions, we are there questions first. Answer my question. Is it clear, right? So here we have this vector living on the vertices. And also you have vectors with tensors, right? Don't have, don't have to be vectors. You have a ten tensors living on the vertices and then you have tensors living on the edges, right? If it's the first layer, it's going to be called the input representation X. If it's inside the network, it's going to be hidden, right? And up until you get to the last one, the final, uh, the final output representation, the uh, Y tilde, right? And then you have the target. How do people make graphs or decide what structure is good? Do we just figure it out by thinking about our application? Yeah, so this is very uh, application specific, right? So this is could be like molecular molecular structures, right? So this is coming directly in your uh, data, right? This could be like a friendship, right? If you have Facebook, for example, uh, Facebook has uh, non-directed, they have both, right? So they have a non-directed connection for friendship. If you're, if you're my friend, I am your friend. Or if you think about Twitter instead, that's a directed graph, right? You follow me, I don't necessarily follow you, right? I mean, no, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I, 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 you don't have to follow back, right? Although it's nice, they say, but I don't care. Um, so you have your data naturally comes with a graph attached, okay? And the point is that we can now use this kind of neural networks uh, that are, you know, leveraging the graph structure that is coming to you. The point is that, uh, that, that actually I didn't stress enough that the title of this lesson was exploiting domain sparsity. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that not all items have to look at every other item, right? So in this case here, we completely forgot about everything about here, right? We only care about our followers, right? Maybe we don't care about who we follow. Okay. Similarly here, here you can just have a few sums that are corresponding to the few items that are coming to you, right? So although this graph can be huge, you know, think about the whole Facebook graph, right? You don't have to look at every person. You just have to look at your neighbor hood, right? Um, and so this sparsity is like key in, uh, to, to actually make these uh, things work in this case. So moving on, we are going to be looking at how to do this in PyTorch, okay? This is actually uh rather non-trivial so we're gonna be watching this together okay so we open the terminal oh oh what happened here okay all right so we go in uh, work github pdl uh conda activate pdl all right uh, and then we have jupyter notebook Gated graph convolutional network. So here I import the OS and then I do the following, right? I set a environment variable. So I set in my, my environment variable, DGL backend to PyTorch such that PyTorch is used. And then I import DGL. Also here I import DGL uh, graph and then this mini GCD uh, GC data, data set, right? Uh, we're gonna be looking at this right now. Hold on. All right. So here, this is just for drawing with nice colors and we don't care. So what is this mini graph classification data set? So mini graph classification data set. 
uh, has this following uh, argument, right? So first of all, actually, what is this DGL, right? So let's figure out what is DGL. So if you open DGL PyTorch here, deep graph library, no? So you may want to look up this stuff. High performance, DGL adopts advanced, blah, blah, blah. There is no description of what this stuff is. Uh, anyway, so this is this library for dealing with uh, deep learning on graphs, okay? And I think there was here a description, build your model with PyTorch and uh, no, okay. We don't have description on this website. Never, never mind. All right. So here I imported this library uh, plot things. Oh yeah, we are talking about here mini graph classification data set. So num graph is going to be the number of graphs in this data set. Uh, min num v is going to be the minimum number of nodes in this graph. Max num v is going to be the max number of nodes. So what are we trying to do in this example and in this, uh, yeah, for, for this uh, example, right? So here I'm going to be specifying the types of uh, graphs we're going to be having. We have the cycle, star, wheel, lollipop, and so on. We're going to be looking at this right now. So we ask for eight number of graphs in a data set, right? which are this one, 4 and 4, 8, which have at from 10 to 20 uh, vertices. And then I display uh, based on the label of what they are, OK? So the first one is going to be the circle graph. And as you can tell, you know, maybe I have to unzoom a little. It has just these labels going from 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on until 11. As you can see, there are double arrows, right? There is a non-directional in this case. Um, in this other case, I have a star graph, okay? As you can tell, each of these, so each of these one, how, how is going to be the agency matrix uh, look for this? How, how is it going to be looking? For this one, you're going to be set to one, the uh, one on the diagonal. No, it's not on the diagonal. There are almost right so for this one you have a one let's say okay for the first row you're gonna have a one at position number two and also a one at the last position number 12. for the number one you're gonna have a one at position one and a one in position three right so you have like a double diagonal with the zeros in the diagonal right so you have a zero diagonal matrix with a Two double two by, by, by diagonals. I forgot how what's the name. There is a word for this matrix, right? With the two things. Yeah, two consecutive ones and, and the, the zero zeros on the diagonal, right? Uh, how about this one, right? What, what is this one here? So zero has ones everywhere, right? Boom, and then the all of them have a one in the first column, right? In the in the first, sorry, in the first row. So the, the, the zero, right, has all the ones, right? So the, the zero has all ones in co uh, columns, in the columns, like all the column, there is a one column, a one column, and we're, and all of the other one are gonna have the ones in the, in the first item, right? So it's gonna be like that, one, one, all zeros, right? Anyway, so this is the star graph. Uh, and as we said here, this can have anything between 10 to 20, right? So this one we said has a matrix of size 12 by 12, right? Because there are 12 vertices. This one here has a matrix of size also 12 by 12 because there are 12 vertices. This one here, I don't know why all of them have size 12. They should be having from 10 to 20, okay? So maybe this is a coincidence, I don't know. Anyway, so these agency matrices have a arbitrary number of, you know, is arbitrary sized. They are square matrices, but they are arbitrary sized. And again, they have specific patterns, right? And this is for the star one, no? The, yeah. Then we have the wheel, 
you can tell this is a wheel. We have a lollipop. Okay, this one goes up to 18, for example. This was going up to, again, 12. Uh, this one goes up to uh, 16, I believe, right? So all of these have specific patterns. Oh, we have also our grid, right? Our image, basically. And this one goes up to 9. Uh, and so on, okay? So what is going to be our objective in this lab? In our objective here is going to be to classify these graphs as one of the eight possible options, okay? It's going to be classification of graphs. How do we do that? So we're going to be just applying that equation we have seen before. So here we just uh, set, you know, my, uh, we create artificial, artificial features. Uh, let me see. And we set the feature on the vertex, vertex to be the degree. So the number of nodes that are connected to that vertex and the number on the edge is simply going to be a one. Okay. So this is fake data I'm putting on my vertices and edges just to initialize this graph. We only care to classify these matrices, right? These uh, agency matrices. Then I create my training set and, and testing set with 350 graphs and 100 graphs, respectively. And then here I have the equation I just showed you before. So this is how it works. In DGL, the message function are expressed as edge UDF, user defined function. It edge user defined function takes in a single argument edge, it has three members, source, destination, and data, right? So the edge uh, user-defined function has source, destination, and data. Uh, for accessing source node features, destination node features, and edge features. The reduce function, so this is allowing us to get the information from the upcoming thing. Then we had to compact the information. So on the actual node, we're going to be using this node UDF. Reduce function are node UDFs. The node UDFs have a singular argument, nodes, which has two members, data and mailbox. The mailbox is going to be the information that comes down from this edge. Data contains the node feature, and mailbox contains the incoming message feature stacked along the second dimension. Blah. Update all does the following. Send a message through all edges from all the vertices. So you have all vertices psh, are shooting through the vertex, the message goes through the, the vertices, the message start arises from the vertices, go through the edges, and then pff, are collected in your receiving end, okay? So these update all send messages through all edges and update all nodes. Optionally apply a function blah. This is a convenient combination for performing send from each you know, original vertex, send through the edge, you know, send through the edge and then receive at a given location. And so let's see how this network is uh, implemented and then I let you go. So we had those matrices, right? A, B, C, D, and E. Remember, I don't know if I can show you. Oh, you have this already here, right? A, B, C, D, and E, right? So here I have A, B, C, and D, E, and there are like matrices. And then we have this batch normalization for, uh, avoiding stuff to blow up. So we are gonna be starting now by computing this thing here that has to travel through the edge, okay? So we compute this stuff that travels through the edge and then we're gonna be aggregating the things together, okay? So let's see how that is done. Uh, maybe, hold on, let me actually, yeah, because if we go in the forward function, in the forward function, simply I define uh, my input as being the uh, some representation that lives, is going to be called X, H actually. And I, I'm going to be using the same letter, uh, or like a placeholder for my X. Then I assign to uh, each node this rotated X like AX, BX, DX, and EX, right? This one here, you have seen before, AX, BX, 
dx and ex, the c was multiplying the h, right? And so we have this one, a, b, d, e. The edges go on e, and then you have the c, e, which is going to be the c, e, right? So these are here, a, b, d, e, are this one, right? a, b, d, e, multiplying the axis, and then you have the c multiplying the representation on the edge. And so you have this one, right? c representation on the edge. And then there is this update all. We saw before that update all calls these two functions, right? It calls the send and the, the receive. And so we're going to be looking at these two things, right? So first one, the message function. We have that the bxj, it's simply this bx, right? So we compute it down here, bx. It's going to be this, we're going to call it bxj, right? This one over here, bxj. So this is coming uh, given to you. Then we want to compute this representation on the edge, which was the summation of these three things, right? So I just pick out these three things, the CE, DX, and EX, and I sum them together, and I have my EJ, exactly as it's written here, right? And then I'm going to be writing on my edge this information, so I, such, such that I can use it later. Finally, what is going to be my message? My message is going to be twofold, two things. I send down this BJ, right? Which is this item here. I just extracted. And then I also send down this edge EJ. Why do I send this EJ down? Because I need this to compute this, uh, what is it, the gate here, right? Cool. So I send this rotated and this uh, rotation and this uh, edge representation. Now that I have all this information coming down the edge, I have to finish this computation and I have to do the computation of the gate. Then I have to multiply with the, the BXJ and then sum together, right? And so we have this done in the reduce function. You have AX, which I just extract from the data that lives on the, 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 the data that lives on the node. My BXJ comes down from the mailbox, which was sent through this message, right? I also have EJ that comes out from this message, EJ. And so here I compute this um, sigma. So sigma J is going to be my sigmoid, right? Simply uh, of this incoming edge information. And then finally, I compute the whole content of this without the receiver connection, right? This AX plus blah. So I have AX, right, which is defined here, plus the summation of this gate, which was like actually just the summation here, times the, the BJs. And then I divide by the summation of all the items in this sigma, right? In this here. So this sigma j divided by the sum is going to be the, uh, like the, the, the soft argmax basically. And then this one is multiplying this bxj, okay? And that's it. So this is gonna be my h, right? Without the residual connection. So we go back here. We uh, extract this h, which was this information here, H, and this E, which was the information we wrote here before, right? So I have E and H, I just extract them out. I uh, multiply by uh, some norm, uh, I just divide by the norm in order to be uh, removing, you know, uh, dependency on the dimension, but we don't care. Like in the attention, we had a beta, right? I apply batch normalization and then I apply the ReLU, right? Like I showed you before here, right? So I have this ReLU plus and the ReLU here plus, and then this is gonna be, we sum the previous very, uh, thing, right? And so here we go. After applying the ReLU, we have the X, original X plus the H and this one here, and then we return. And this is it. Uh, the, I have a multi-layer perceptron at the end, which is simply uh, having like my my data goes uh, inside. Hold on. 
So I had just a multi-layer perception, right? With a fully connected layer here. And so finally you had your gated, gated graph convolutional network. Uh, we have some embeddings at the beginning. And then we have this gated graph convolutional network and then multi-layer perception. You get the original uh, H and E through these embedding matrices. <clears throat> you forward this stuff in the graph convolutional layer as many times as layers as you, as you have. And then finally, we compute the mean representation uh, coming out from the last uh, layer. And then we send this through a multi-layer perceptron. So here I just show you this and I just um, train, okay? And so you generate the X, the E, you compute the uh, output of the model, you compute the loss, you zero the gradient, you perform back, uh, backward, and then you step in the gradient descent, in the opposite, gradient, opposite direction of the gradient. And finally, we're gonna have here that you can see the test accuracy uh, goes to 100%. And so here we managed to see how you can train a neural network to classify graphs, which are represented by matrices, agency matrices, matrices of arbitrary sizes, right? So, so far we were, you know, we, we, we learned last time how to deal with sets of arbitrary numbers, you know, arbitrary elements. And now we learn how to basically classify these graphs, which are represented by these matrices, which have also variable sizes. That's it for, the, for, for today. It's, it's a lot of uh, things, I think. Uh, but I think if you survive until the end, most of you are still here. So I think you managed to follow along. If there are more questions, if there are any questions, write them on Campus Wire. I will answer everything, right? Uh, and unless there are imminent questions right now, I give you five seconds. Four, three, two, one. There are no more questions. So I see you next week for more content. Okay. Have a nice day. Enjoy your Thursday. Have a nice uh, end of the week. Take care. Bye. I hope you like it. I liked it a lot. <laughs>